Lesson one, dialogue of shapes. So the question when you start out with a multi-shape composition where there's a lot of different items, um, where do you begin? Um, it's easy for me to just kind of start massing in these complex objects and reducing them. Uh, this is something I've done a thousand times over, but where did I begin? And it would be right here, reducing the entire world everything that I look at to its basic, most pure geometric essence. This is something I talk about on a regular basis, but it is the cornerstone of everything that we do in drawing and painting. Now, when I look at anything in nature, whether it's a tree in a field, whether it's a nautilus seashell, if it's a dog sleeping on the floor, I'm always reducing everything to its basic shape and then lighting it with a specific direction of light. And as I look at these shapes, I have the same pattern, background, external contour, half tone, the highlight, half tone beyond it, the deepest shade, reflected light, external contour, background, cast shadow. Now, if I can do that with a cylinder, and then I choose to see something as a cylinder and force it upon it, then I instantly know how to light it. And I don't have to be kind of confused by the excess of information that might be in front of me, but instead I can choose to see what my understanding desires to see. So it's the exact same thing with a cone. Uh, it's the exact same thing with a cube. So if these are all the most basic ideas, a sphere, same patterns going across each one, of course there's different variations, then we can start to spin the different objects and we can light them as we see fit. We can chop them up and eventually we'll get to the place where we'll, we will do what's called compound shapes. Compound shapes is coming up with elements of each one of these. An example would be the cone turned upside down with the sphere on top. That is an ice cream cone, very basic example. But now as we're beginning to jump into the still life, we can ask ourselves, how can we best apply these basic ideas to the objects that we are standing in front of? And the answer is to be decisive. If, you, if there's any ambiguity, it's going to crush your progress. It's going to hinder it. So as we look at our objects, let's say, okay, the milk container, I'm going to slice the top, that little spout portion that kind of a uh, bends in, I'm going to slice that off and choose to see the whole thing as being one big cylinder. So if that whole entire thing is one big cylinder and I know how to light it, then I'm coming to nature with a predetermined set of ideas, which I'm foisting upon nature. At first blush, that might seem like something that's uh, possibly unartistic or something that um, would crush creativity or just like kind of a playfully inquisitive spirit. But I can assure you that when artists such as Cecilia Bowe did this and she had these magnificent paintings, I forget how wide they are, but I'm going to say they're 20 feet wide, magnificent paintings called the horse fair. And she, these horses are galloping across this open field and they're, they're prancing and they're turning and their heads are turning. How could you ever get a horse to stay still for that? You might say, well, I could paint it from a photo. Well, if you don't have understanding, you still wouldn't be able to see all of those horses galloping. You need to have understanding that you bring. So I'm going to then say that the egg is nothing more than a sphere. So I'm intentionally just taking the shapes from before, not really doctoring them up any, because I want you to see how deliberate my decision making is and how really I'm actually not finessing these decisions a whole great amount, but I'm just forcing them into a relative area and I'm lighting it accordingly. Now moving on to the flower bag, I choose to see the flower bag as being a cube. And do you see the plane break where the front plane, the light plane meets the dark plane, the plane on the right of it. Um, I'm choosing to see the corner of the flower bag as that break in the plane. Um, it's exaggerated, and that's the purpose of this. When we exaggerate, we can understand it with more clarity. So as I'm looking at the flower bag, 
I do want to actually spend a moment and think about what I don't want to see. So I don't want to see um, the interesting lettering on there. I don't want to see the symbol of the knight on horseback. Um, I don't want to see the crinkly texture of the bag. The only thing I really want to see is the most basic ideas. This is light, this is dark, this is the outermost external contour. On the left side, this is the outermost on the right side. This is the bottom, this is the top. So you could say, well, the bag might start out cubicle, but then it, as it goes up higher, it's all distorted. Uh, that's exactly the point. When you have at least a base to start with, then you can build on top of it. So pretend for a moment that the bag actually is chopped. We actually just chopped it right at the point in which it starts to get crinkled, and then we can change our game plan as we get up there. But suffice to say, a cube would be my recommended way of reducing this to its most basic geometric essence. Now, we may ask ourselves, uh, how do we view that cast iron? It's kind of a hybrid between a cylinder and an upside down cone chopped. So let's do that. Let's flip a cone and let's chop it. And then after we chop it, let's choose to eliminate the portion of the cone that no longer serves our purposes. So in my own work, I'm doing this constantly, mentally. I'm actually foisting this upon a lot of things that I look at. And now I just slide it down into its spot. I'll play around with the different proportions. And again, this is a glimpse into my mind and the mind of many artists, uh, professional artists who I know, uh, this is how many of us conceive of shapes. This is how many of us conceive of forms. We are constantly in our mind shape-shifting. We're moving things. We're stretching things. We're skewing things. We're raising things. We're lowering things. And the, it's without the ability to do that, I don't quite know that you can approach the phenomenon of the world around you. I actually think without the tools to stretch, skew, cut, crop, extend, make more squat, make taller, you get the point. Without that ability, I, I think walking out into a field is overwhelming. When you walk out into a field and you behold, let's say you're standing, um, I live on Long Island and we have these beautiful soaring bluffs that get hit with this gold light on the North shore of Long Island I live on the South Shore, but on the North Shore, these bluffs get hit right from the side and they just turn this burning orange. Now, when you're standing there, and there are people at the base of that sand bluff. You can easily get distracted by everything that's taking place. But if you look at that scene and you say, no, nope, I'm choosing to see this as one massive cube. That whole bluff is a cube. The people at the base of it are little cylinders and the heads on top of those cylinders are just nothing more than spheres. I'm going to light them with the light source that I predetermine. It's coming from over there in the West. And then I'm going to make the figures a little bit smaller than they might actually be to make the cliffs seem even more grandiose. So that's just an example of how we as artists are forever shape-shifting, shape-distorting, and mentally conceiving of things as we see fit so that nature might abide by really our vision. So now let's take it back to the drawing board. Well, if it's the case that we're reducing everything to these shapes, how then do we determine the size of each shape? Well, again, try to think of the height relative to the width. Try to think of, okay, if here is the top of the milk jug, then the bottom of the milk jug, that looks like it's sitting slightly higher than the bottom of the cast iron. So one of my favorite uh, passages from Robert Beverly Hale in his book, Drawing Lessons of the Great Masters, he says repeatedly that artists are to develop a hunter's crosshairs. So what is meant by a hunter's crosshairs? By that, we mean that we can drop a true vertical and a true horizontal on anything that we look at in nature. So as 
you, you can in essence say, well, you're drawing a grid over it with your eyes. Exactly. Uh, this doesn't come instantly, and it requires a lot of holding up, you know, a little um, string so that we could measure the top of something, the bottom of something, how far left it goes, how far right it goes by dropping a vertical line. Um, these things come in time and we can, on our own paper, we can run horizontals, we can run verticals. Sometimes I literally will get a T-square out and hold it up to the side of the paper and I have my little artist T-square and I'll just hold it out to the side so that I can see what truly is horizontal. I don't do that often. I trust my eye more than that. But uh, sometimes in a dire straits, I will resort to that type of thing. And having established the biggest, broadest external shapes, I then can start moving on to these details. Now, I, I approach the details of this composition with one thing of which I'm keenly aware of. I will be shifting shapes often. So I don't get married to these things so quickly. I'm just still courting them. And I don't get too precious in the sense of, oh no, I have to move the bottom of the cast iron. Uh, my drawing is over. I failed. Uh, no, it's not like that. Right now, I would encourage anybody who's starting out uh, to view their drawing almost as being like wet clay. Wet clay, when it's first put down on a stand, and we're trying to mass out the general idea of, a, let's say, a portrait head, we view that wet clay as being something malleable, and we're just going to keep on refining it as we go. But there's something about the finality of a stroke of graphite, a stroke of charcoal, a stroke of oil paint. There's something about the finality of that that we get married to it, and we're like, oh, it's, it's this line, and I really will do anything on earth to hold on to that line and not shift it around. But if I were asked to identify one major difference between a student and a highly seasoned professional painter, what I would say is that a student, and by professional, I don't mean this is what you do for a living. I mean that you've reached the level of craftsmanship where you're really a consummate craftsman and you're an artist, you're in command of what you do. What's the difference between a student and a professional artist? And I would say the ability to change a decision, not recklessness. I had a friend once who was a bit reckless and at the slightest little problem, he'd erase the whole entire thing, not reckless, but not precious. And so I put down my marks keenly aware that I could be erasing any of them, that I could be erasing all of them. I'm not going to charge straight in just because I've encountered one little obstacle and erase, erase the whole thing, but I'm not going to hold on to one decision and kind of like caress it, er erase it lightly, um, gently, you know, try to move it like millimeter by millimeter. No, if it needs to move, I'm going to move it. If it needs to be raised up higher, I'm going to raise it higher. Um, I'm choosing to see the handle as tilted up, even though it's not in the picture. I don't like how flat the drawing is without the handle raised up. And sometimes cast iron handles can be raised up just like I'm doing right here. So again, this is an example of me seeing something. And as I'm seeing it in my mind's eye, I'm forcing it on my drawing. The measuring spoon in front, I'm conceiving of this as being a sphere chopped. And the axis of the sphere is kind of at a tilt because the measuring spoon is at a tilt. The top of the milk jug is really an upside down cone. I don't know if you can see that. And the upside down cone kind of disappears into the cylinder of the jug. So again, these are all ideas that I bring to my piece and I just, I just force it on the piece, even though the piece may not entirely be in accordance with what I'm choosing to see. 
uh, the slats of the door behind. I'm not really going to put them where they are. I don't necessarily like where they sit, but I'm going to put them where I want them to be. That's my decision. And now I'm measuring the height to the width. I think the height is half the length of the width. And so I don't want the cast iron to be too squat. I don't want it to be too tall. Um, I want it to be just perfect. Uh, my reason for this is simple. I like that cast iron shape. There are certain things I look at, let's say uh, certain models of cars that come out. And forgive me if this sounds arrogant and smug, but I see certain models of cars hit the road and I look at them and I'm like, ah, bad decision. They just should have made this a little bit more squat. They should have stretched that out a little bit more. And I understand that there are aerodynamics involved, but still there's something about cars of old. There's something about 1950s shapes up until the sobs of the 1990s, where the aesthetic of these shapes just thrills me. They're just so beautiful to look at. There's some cars rolling out in, in the year 2020 that are absolutely perfect. They're beautiful. But then there are some that just probably could have used a painter on site who had an aesthetic sensibility of what was beautiful and what wasn't. So as I'm working on this still life, I'm actually looking at that cast iron shape and I'm thinking to myself, whatever I draw is not going to be as good looking as that cast iron. That cast iron is just cool. It just has this great shape to it. It's absolutely perfect. That cast iron is a lot like, for me, um, an old Chevy truck with a beautiful fenders on the side of it. There's something about the curvilinear, the rounds of it, that's just really pleasing to look at. So I will go out of my way to be sure that I get exactly what I'm looking at and that I really just enjoy the rhythms of this object. So I've kind of messed in all of my biggest, broadest shapes. I'm not done, but I'm pleased with how they speak to each other. I'm looking at the negative space in between the positive spaces. I'm looking at how that flower bag kind of wraps its arm around the milk jug. I like how the eggs are almost like little kids at the base of mom and dad's feet or something like that. I know it sounds silly, but a lot of my friends who are poets um, agree with me that you have to see objects as having character, as having form. And so it's time to start massing in. I grab my graphite shavings off of my sanding block and I just start smudging. And you could say, well, why don't you just hatch it in with a pencil? Because it takes too long. And I prefer to just mess it in quick and just get a base idea so that I can see the biggest, broadest shapes as quickly as possible. And I'd encourage you to do the same. If you uh, don't like getting your hands dirty, uh, maybe this video isn't the right video for you. But um, if you like putting your hands into the graphite, it's completely safe. And just make big, broad decision, decisions and then look at the implications once you mass it in quickly. In case you can't tell, I really enjoy this stage.
Thank you.